All right, so I'm Kevin. i um, done a couple of these talks already. If you don't know me, I work at Limelight with Hans. Um, and I'm leading the configuration management project at Limelight. So what is SaltStack? Um, at its core, it's a, it's a tool for uh, what's called orchestration. And um, the SALT method of doing this is to keep open a bus between all of your masters and your, your basically where SALT runs and uh, the devices that you want to control. Um, and that lets you run commands or what SALT calls execution modules on those uh, other devices. And those devices can then report their status back over that same bus. Um, so the, the bus is kind of what unify, or makes uh, SALT unique between uh, the, the different configuration management choices out there today. Um, that was all SALT did when it, it started out. It was basically um, in the same class as something like Fabric or M Collective, a um, little bit lighter weight and faster. But uh, what was realized at some point was that they could build a configuration management tool on top of the orchestration bus. Um, this is kind of interesting. So a lot of the other tools, the competitors in this space uh, start, you know, that you, you've got Chef and Puppet and CF Engine. These tools run via cron or some type of scheduling daemon uh, to basically every, you know, period run uh, a convergence. Um, because you have this persistent bus, uh, SALT's kind of a paradigm shift. It lets you do things a lot faster in terms of when you run those co uh, configuration uh, applications. And you can even react to different things changing. When a, when a change happens on one box, that can trigger an event that then causes other things to happen. So um, the primary uh, those are your two primary entries into the system. You're either doing orchestration at the command line or via the API, or you're doing configuration management, which is stored in uh, some type of file backing or, or version control system um, to apply things that you want uh, to stay, you know, to stay converged over time. Um, so at Limelight, we were curious. You know, we we had. Um, we still actually have a, a very large CF Engine 2 deployment. Um, and the problem with CF Engine 2 is mainly that uh, doing things in it is laborious. The, the uh, domain-specific language isn't very friendly. It's, you know, it's its own thing. Uh, it doesn't have any concept of like a template, a file template, where you can grab variables uh, or, or grab data and, and post them into variables. Um, so you know, this was kind of becoming more and more of a problem. We had these acquisitions that were using Chef, uh, and they were doing really nice stuff with it. Um, so you know, we our, our initial inclination was, all right, let's you know, let's look into Chef. Let's see what we have to do to make Chef work uh, at the the scale that we have. And we did this, and you know, we kind of figured out. Um, we figured that we could do it. It wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be the easiest thing in the world, but what we realized is just because we had these uh, relatively large chef deployments didn't really put us ahead versus the other systems. So we decided to open up the, uh, the Bake Off to a couple other systems. Um, and we have some, some folks that are very proficient with Puppet. And we also wanted to look at CF Engine 3 just to make sure we weren't missing anything. Um, at the end of this, we, we decided on SALT. And it was actually a pretty uh, rigorous process that we went through to, to make this decision. The things that drove our choice, um, I think the implementation in Python fit the backgrounds of the people that would be working on it better. Um, so we're, we're comfortable going in there and making changes and, and working with the upstream project as needed. We liked that it was an open community project. Uh, we found just tons of, of activity on GitHub and on the mailing list uh, and in the bug tracker. Um, there's a lot of velocity to this project. So we weren't you know, necessarily afraid that we would be doing all of the heavy lifting, although we, we were ready to, to do uh, some of it. Um, and in that same vein, we like the rapport with other high scale users. Um, I, don't, I won't name them, but they'll be at SaltConf. 
Uh, there's a lot of people that we were actually able to reach out to their config management teams and kind of talk with them and figure out what they were doing to make it work in their, in their environments. Uh, and the, you know, the final thing that nailed it for us was the scalability. And this is kind of a, a, a broad word, I think, but we actually have several vectors where this matters. We have a number of different teams and, and people on those teams. Um, we needed to figure out how we could create a system or a framework that they could plug into and people wouldn't interfere with each other, although we still want to provide you know, the, the base uh, system that they can use so they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time for things like you know, basic operating system configuration. We have a number of platforms, and uh, I'll go th into that in a second. Um, products, that ties directly into teams. Um, but something interesting in our case is the ge uh, our geography. We've got a lot of data centers and we want them to be independent from each other. We don't want to tie, uh, you know, have a, a command center that if that goes down, we can't make changes, things like that. Uh, SALT was the easiest way for us to get to in that, that one in particular, I think uh, a big win with, and I'll go into that in a little bit. So as I was saying, we've got a lot of platforms. This is just the nature of the beast. We're a big FreeBSD shop that's running our, our bread and butter stuff. Um, some of our other products are on Ubuntu long-term support. We're looking at supporting the, uh, the last two releases at, at any given time. Uh, this allows people to have a transition period and you know, move to the newer releases at their, uh, within their, um, you know, their own product roadmaps. Um, we have another product that's big on CentOS, and there are some smaller uh, enterprise things that you know, have to run on that, uh, or, or Red Hat derivative. And then uh, interesting uh, new addition is Arista. These are uh, top of rack switches or spine switches that actually have a, a full Linux implementation as the control plane. Um, underneath, it's actually a Fedora box, uh, which is kind of an interesting choice. But um, we can treat it like a server when we want to. So we can deploy monitoring to these switches the same way we do it with our, uh, our servers. And down the line, we can actually configure the switch uh, in the same system or, or make the switch react to changes on the host or vice versa. Um, that's something that, you know, with SALT, it, it's actually very intuitive how to do that. Um, doing that with other systems, you know, it, it might be a little bit more work. There might be more development effort. So if you're interested in SALT, um, there are a couple ways to, to get going. There's this bootstrap script that you like wget and pipe to sudo sh or whatever, if you're inclined to do that. Um, better method, there's distro packaging for, uh, there, for instance, there's an Ubuntu PPA. FreeBSD port's generally uh, very up to date. Um, it's in EPEL for, for your Red Hat derivatives. Um, that's also always pretty up to date. Good way to install it. Um, one thing that kind of uh, rubs me the wrong way with some of the other products, they use what's called omnibus packaging. Um, I don't like that for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so I think, you know, since it's in EPEL or since it's in these PPAs, it's very easy to install it the right way and, and stay up to date. Um, as far as choosing your topology, uh, you have a few choices uh, depending on how how you want to, you know, how intense your environment is and how many systems you have. So the most, uh, the, the general, general way you see it deployed, you have a, a single salt master, um, and this is either, you know, a VM or a dedicated hardware or, you know, some shared system that's running uh, a process with the, the salt master on it. The master is in charge of doing uh, key delegations. So this verifies that the, the systems that you're talking to are who they say they are and they don't change uh, out from under you. It's responsible for holding the salt states repo as well as uh, the pillar and I'll go into those in a little bit. Um, but say you, you know, you're, you're a little bit more nimble, you, you only have a few machines, you actually don't need to run a salt master. You can run it uh, masterless. This would be equivalent if you're familiar with other systems to like uh, Chef Solo or uh, Chef Zero. Um, there's a new mode in the latest release called Salt SSH. This is this lets you run uh, a remote agent over an SSH connection, so you don't need to install software on your your configured devices. Um, this is basically like an Ansible workalike, um, and there are obviously there are a lot of uh, 
cases where that might be appropriate. Um, but it's, it's much higher overhead when you have to negotiate uh, an SSH connection to, to your device and make changes. You don't get a lot of the, some of the interesting things that SALT gives you. And then others, uh, you can do a hybrid. Um, you know, it, at Limelight, we're doing what uh, a multi-master deployment with Syndix. So um, this, this lets us eliminate a single point of failure uh, as far as a master goes and even uh, the geography of where those masters are. Um, the Syndix are basically like a proxy. We can deploy these at every data center and the masters talk to those and then those talk to the nodes in that data center. Uh, this just keeps your, your bus traffic a little bit more contained um, and pushes the key delegation all the way down to those syndics because that's fairly uh, CPU intensive. Um, there is one other interesting mode. You can use what's called a, um, a proxy minion. And this lets you uh, basically configure a device that doesn't have full compute capabilities. For instance, you could kick out messages to like a serial console if you need to control a PDU or something. Uh, kind of interesting. So workflow is really important in a configuration management system. This is, you know, you dictate how your teams are going to basically deploy applications and, and run them in production. Um, SALT generally has two interaction points for that, uh, for that configuration management. You've got your state repo and your pillar. So the state repo uh, is basically YAML files with uh, a Jinja 2 template, and then your actual configuration files, which are just text generally. Um, this gives you a great deal of control. So the Jinja template language is, uh, if you've ever done like web development with something like Django, you, you may have used it. Um, or if you've done web development in other languages, you've probably used some type of analog to it. This lets you substitute variables and do loops and things like that in your configuration files. Uh, phenomenally useful for configuration management. Um, the pillar is a, a distinction in SALT. It's, in, in other systems, uh, they have different words for this, but basically you have data or attributes that apply to a host or a group of hosts that you want to populate into those config files. Um, generally, this is, uh, again, a YAML uh, with Jinja templating. Um, you can actually put this into like a, a SQL database or uh, other types of backends as, as you need. Um, I'll show you examples of both these two. It'll become a little bit more apparent when we get to the demo, um, if, as long as we can read it. Um, generally, you put these two into a, a repo, a version control system. Uh, we use Git, and we've built our workflow around Git uh, concepts like feature branches, pull requests, and specific to GitHub, webhooks. Uh, so when a pull request comes in, it sends a webhook to Salt. We actually spin up a container, run that state on, uh, on that container, and then push that feedback back into the pull request and say, this is what worked, or you know, here's where your syntax errors are. Um, at Limelight, we actually decided to not use the pillar uh, extensively. There's one location we use it. The pillar is server side, so it, allow, it allows the salt master to um, control who has access to that data. So we use what's called a GPG pillar. This stores uh, GPG encrypted data. So we use this to put in things like database passwords and stuff like that into our configuration. Um, this is unique. Uh, I don't know of anybody else doing this. The reason we decided to do this mainly was that we wanted to atomically change our states. And if you have uh, data dependencies on the pillar, you can get into this state, you know, this, this place where you have to evolve your pillar uh, structure for some reason and your state at the same time. We weren't, we weren't very comfortable with, with doing that uh, at scale. So, we actually put all of our data into states or uh, other systems like our, our configuration, man, our, our inventory control. Um, and, and we've actually found this to be pretty palatable. It, it went a lot e uh, smoother than we expected. So just a brief aside, um, as relating, this is just related to workflow, so I wanted to bring it up. 
Um, we use Vagrant to actually develop the, the configuration management framework. Um, and we plan on using this and, and giving this to the, de the product teams and the developers to when, you know, when they go to deploy or improve a product, they're using the same thing. Uh, Vagrant's just a, a wrapper around VirtualBox or, or other virtualization tools that lets you define what I'm calling uh, like system dependencies. So if you need to run a piece of software on a particular operating system and you need you know, this, configure, uh, this topology, like these network, uh, uh, this you know, local network to this other database server or whatever, you can define that in a Vagrant file and run it from your laptop or some type of development server. Um, it greatly reduces the ramp up cost because you can say, hey, just go you know, run that Vagrant and kind of poke around until you're comfortable with the thing. You know, you're not gonna break anything, you're running it locally. Um, then there's another tool from the same company, uh, HashiCorp, it's called Packer. Um, we use this to create repeatable images. So basically we're taking operating systems from an upstream, we're somehow editing that, either you know, installing or removing packages, installing or removing configuration that is needed before we can bootstrap salt, or um, you know, installing uh, basically other modifications. Um, we use salt as soon as possible in this Packer flow. So Packer has the bare minimum uh, amount of basically shell script to get bootstrapped into a salt masterless configuration. Then we're actually deploying our salt states to get it to that point in time that when that image is being built to where salt is. This is really interesting because now we have a complete loop of when we bake an image and when that image goes into production, you know, it, it's, it's going to continue following configuration management. So when we upgrade the base packages or the base configuration, when we then build a new image, these things are basically lined up. Uh, and, and that's kind of uh, a, an interesting thing to me. I, I really like creating feedback loops. Um, so I'm not sure this is going to work. I was having some trouble with the VPN, and it's pretty small text anyways, but uh, the anatomy of like a, an orchestration command, basically you say salt uh, and then a targeting group. So in this case, um, I've got the backslash because this is the shell, so I'm esca escaping the star. I'm saying talk to everybody and just ping them. And uh, I actually got a full convergence here. So I heard back from the four VMs that I'm running on my laptop right now. Um, you can do for instance, uh, like a command dot run is just um, basically executing a command on your what Salt calls minions or the devices you're controlling with shell semantics. So I can, for instance, run an ls on all of those boxes that you just saw. Um, this is obviously kind of silly, but um, the orchestration things can get more complex. You could do something like uh, pkg dot upgrade. This would go out and run the package manager, and this is abstracted. So um, again, I've got these, uh, if we, you know, we go up here and look, I've got a, a CentOS box, a FreeBSD box, uh, Ubuntu Precise and Ubuntu Trusty running on the master. Um, when I do that package upgrade, it's going to go out and talk yum, talk package on FreeBSD, or talk uh, apt on these uh, Ubuntu boxes. Um, so that's kind of interesting, right? You can, you can build these abstractions up with these execution modules. Then your other uh, interaction point, uh, when you're doing your state management or your, you know, your, your, your configuration management, um, you can run that from the salt command. You can push one out, uh, push it out uh, manually. You can say um, state dot high state. And a high state just says apply all of the states that apply to that device. Um, yeah, this, is, this broke earlier before I had the VPN up, so it's probably not going to work. But um, I don't want to take time looking into that. Um, so basically, this just says go out and run your, your actual uh, policy. Generally, this will be on a schedule or a reactor uh, uh, in the field. You, you're not probably not going to manually run a high state except when you're doing development. Um, so uh, 
you know, what we found, and, and you know, this was related to why we chose to, to go with SaltStack as our configuration management tool, but one thing that's really interesting, all of Salt is, is just Python. Um, this is actually changing in some of the other tools. They're, for scalability reasons, they're having to refactor their backend in uh, you know, JVM languages or, or what have you. Um, you know, that, that's fine, but uh, there, it's actually a, what Salt kind of saw is that it's an architecture problem, not necessarily a language performance problem to get scalability. So uh, the fact that all of SALT is written in Python lets you know, me or anybody on the team go in and edit or fix anything that we don't like um, in a single language. That's, you know, if you have a multi-language multi implementation for the, the CM product and then the policy, for instance, uh, that really you know, makes the barrier to entry a lot higher. So with that said, um, you can write these execution modules, which are things that run on the command line. Um, you know, and that generally an operator would go out and say, I want to you know, run this thing to cause something to happen. Um, you can write state modules, which are actually um, ya your, your YAML files, and these are things that are, are applied to, to reach convergence on a system. Generally, those state modules are actually composed of the execution modules, kind of interesting. Um, it's worth going and looking at the source code for some of those. Um, you can develop things called returners, which at the end of the run, you can feed that data back into, for instance, a database or Elasticsearch, um, you know, and then you can go query that and, and do whatever you need to do with it. You can write grains. Grains are um, like OHI or factor in the, the other systems. These are just little pieces of Python that tell you something about a system. So for instance, um, what packages in, are installed or what kernel version you're running or what kernel modules are loaded. Um, I'm writing one right now to pull the serial numbers and uh, interface details off of hard disks so we can populate our inventory system with that. Um, kind of, you know, kind of interesting, very flexible. Runners are uh, execution modules that the, uh, the, the minions can call the master to run. Um, we're using this for access control. So we've got these API-driven systems like our inventory system. We don't want to deploy you know, uh, credentials on the edge for this inventory system for all the boxes. It's just, it's unnecessary. So what we did, we created a runner um, and the, the edge can make requests into the master that then goes to the API, talks to it, gets, you know, does a, gets a return and then submits it back to the, the edge. Kind of interesting. Um, and then, you know, finally the core itself. Um, so we've got mo uh, pretty much three people that are working the majority of their time on this configuration management framework. We all have patches in SaltStack itself already. Um, and you know that's not because we're like awesome. It's just because it's not that hard to do. Um, that's actually you know really that that's a very high praise I think for the Salt community and the, the product that they have. Um, they're they're very quick to give you feedback and also merge your changes too. So this is a very good thing. So um, some of the things that we're doing, uh, I'd like to put out into the public either as source code or uh, you know blog entries or something. I, I need to figure out how I'm going to do that. But we've got this thing called Lec that gives us Garrett-like peer review on top of GitHub. We use GitHub Enterprise. Um, so this tool watches for pull requests. When, it, when one comes in, it's setting off this chain of events to go uh, do lint checks on the the Python code that might have changed, as well as uh, do a convergence test on that actual uh, state that, that was being checked in, the formula. Um, but that would be useful for other projects. Say you have like a, um, you know, the Kibana talk, you know, they want to run a JS lint or something on their GitHub. Um, this might potentially be interesting to them too, or, or any other, anybody else that uses GitHub. Um, this thing I'm calling the F master engine is how we're actually creating uh, containers to run these feature branch uh, of the state repo. 
So our thoughts there are that when a developer wants to go out and create a new service, they can do this in a branch and they can run it on uh, a master and get that real production-like feel when, that, when everything checks out and when it's been peer reviewed, it gets pushed into the master branch, uh, the actual master branch. But the mechanics of both of these things are the same. It's running the same software. You're just running slightly different policy. Um, we've got an Elasticsearch in, uh, ingest right now. We, we actually uh, extended uh, an existing open source project and, and one of our guys created um, you know, using the Elasticsearch API, uh, a way to put stuff that's going in the salt bus into Elasticsearch. The reason we're doing this is we want to build Kibana dashboards to see what's going on. Um, we figure that this will actually be the primary uh, interface for operators and for our NOC to see, you know, whether a system's converged or whether there's problems in our environment. Um, obviously, I, I said earlier, we're a FreeBSD shop, a big FreeBSD shop. Um, I'm personally committed to making sure that Salt works awesome on FreeBSD. Uh, a lot of my patches so far have been that. Um, and I'm also helping uh, the .org, the actual project, uh, use Salt, and they've got another guy. Um, and the FreeBSD project's actually running uh, continuous integration builds. So whenever somebody submits a change to uh, the source tree, um, it's kicking off a VM to do a build world and, and some, some basic checks. Uh, and finally, I want to kind of document our trials and tribulations. I think this is interesting stuff to other people that are looking to deploy SALT. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to save you some time. I just, you know, if, if we document the things that we had to go through or uh, how we did things, I just need to find the right avenue for doing that in the company um, and, and seeing where I can make that public. Um, lastly, I'm going to be giving uh, a talk with another guy um, on the team at SaltConf next month. Um, there are still registrations available. It's somewhat expensive, so because um, the early bird registration is done. But um, if you are going to that, um, feel free to come and harass me or whatever during the talk. Heckle it. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll be on YouTube. Um, after and uh, hopefully that'll be interesting. I'm going to actually go into a lot greater detail with uh, uh, some of these things that I was talking about, like the F Master Engine, and we'll actually show you the uh, the Elasticsearch and Kibana pieces. Um, so I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Um, with that said, I, I'll open it up to questions real quick. I I, I should show you um, what the actual states look like, but I don't know how useful that's going to be on this screen. Yeah, I guess that doesn't look that bad. Uh, so the entry point in the states repo is this top file. Uh, this is where you say, this is where you give targeting information for uh, your other formula. So up top here we have basically these formula that run on the master. Um, <coughs> Generally, it's like uh, package notation. So you have, you know, the, 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 the first, the left side is like the, uh, the, the directory and the right side is the actual uh, implementation. Um, we actually don't, uh, some of the stuff in here is for, this is our actual production uh, data, but um, most of the stuff in our top file is actually dynamic. We're using, uh, where you see the, this, uh, uh, bracket and the percentage sign, that's where you're using a Jinja template call. So we actually dynamically assign roles from uh, our inventory tool and that's where we get, uh, that's where we define um, our other policies for the products and such. So I'll go in and look at, uh, I've got a simple, um, I'll, I'll just look at this CF engine formula because it's, it's really simple. Um, what we're doing here uh, when we build images, because we're uh, in a transition period, we're actually putting CF engine into those images still. Um, and there's just some special cases here for Red Hat. I have to deploy a special package. Otherwise, we're uh, pulling the package out of a map file. 
Um, then we're installing you know, just a, a configuration file that we're pulling from salt. Um, and that requires the package to be installed. So salt makes it really easy to define dependencies between different formula uh, states. Um, and I mentioned a map file. Maps are where you can break things out that uh, define basically um, you know, differences between systems. So in this case, you know, the package name for Debian is different than the one for FreeBSD is different than the one for Red Hat. Um, so I just define that in this map file, and then I reference those uh, in, the, in the actual state. Um, that's really about, uh, I, I'm not sure I, I want to go into too much more depth than that. I'll open it up to questions if, uh, if you have any. Does SALT allow you to do dependencies? You have to have A before you can have B yeah, and, so and actually be able to order the count on the order on a regular basis. Yes, so that, that's called requisites. And um, there are di there, there's like four main types of requisites. So you can, you can do a forward or a reverse, uh, um, basically requirement. You can say, before I install you know, this package, I need to have this file or this repo defined. Or you can inverse it. You can say, um, you can say, you know, when when this file goes to get installed, don't do it until this other thing happens. So that lets you put the the dependency in the most natural place. Um, depending on what you're doing, it, you know, you you want to invert it sometimes. Okay. Now does it does it actually build a tree and put them in the right? Order? Yes. Puppet has those dependencies. But it doesn't do any ordering, so it might take you 4,000 runs before you actually get things to yeah, you, in the right plug directly. you have to keep running until you get convergence. So um, SALT, for the most part, doesn't have that problem. Um, there, are, there is one exception. Uh, I had to build a delay uh, when we update SALT itself. Um, if you restart SALT while it's running, the key renegotiates, so your session becomes invalid. So I had to create a module that postpones that until the end of a salt run. Um, so you, in that case, for, for us, we have to do two, two runs to make sure everything works. That's the only problem we've run into as far as ordering. Everything else, the dependency system works great. Um, and by default, it's in order. So the the, the, how it's listed in your top file and how your formulas are laid out, everything runs in linear order save for when you have a requisite, then it'll do a reordering. Um, there's a, a graph plugin, like it uses dot to, to actually plot a dependency. Uh, I need to look into that and see if I can make that pretty, and I think that'd be kind of nice to, to have an open source thing. Uh, It'd be nice to be actually s see what ordering yeah. salt has, because you, when you start using variables, you don't know what's going to come into. Especially when other, you know, in, in terms of people scalability, like I was saying, we, you know, we need to, when somebody makes a change, you know, there's unintended consequences. You need some way to, to visualize that. Um, so that's something that's on my, my book or my radar. In the back, yes? In your experience, have you used runners to do anything like uh, dynamic updates or load balance tier? Putting new in the cluster, for example? No, we actually haven't done that yet. Um, that would be a good use if, 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 the, if the remote has like an API or something. Um, so SALT's got a, a, a number of different ways you could approach that problem. If you want to actually say the, the load balancer is CLI driven, you could run a proxy minion somewhere that talks to that CLI over you know, SSH or Telnet or Serial, whatever the case is. Um, and you could, you could, when you spin this app up, you could create an event. So the app just says, hey, I'm a new, new app. That's, that's the extent that that product owner uh, you know, exposed. Then the load balancer module can s listen for that event and say, oh, a new app spun up. That's his, or her, you know, the, the back end um, on this port, and here's your new front, you know, front port or whatever. So there's a lot of ways you can do that. Uh, if a runner would be the most direct way, but um, if you want to make it event driven, there's also you know possibilities there. Yes. I'm just curious if you guys looked at uh, Ansible at all and why you went with Salt Yeah, we did um, very briefly, uh, and we kind of tossed it out of the running. 
it's actually a, it's a great tool uh, for small deployments, I think. Um, and they've got a lot of velocity as well as a project. They're, they're moving quickly. Um, the, they're very similar. Uh, the way, you know, they're both Python. They both uh, use YAML as their, their primary, you know, interaction. Um, the difference is Ansible, uh, and as far as I know, this is still true, it uses SSH um, to talk to the, the remote. That's very expensive. Uh, you know, if you're talking about a handful of machines, doesn't matter. But when you're talking about, you know, uh, five figure count, that, that adds up very quickly. Um, and because you're not running an agent on the, the edge, you can't do event based or event driven systems as far as, as from what I've seen from them. Um, we want to get into that, you know, very deeply. We want events to be triggering things rather than, you know, uh, time bound things or, or whatever else. Um, I think that's a, a big innovation that Salt has over the other guys. Yes. What's an example of an event? <coughs> uh, so an event can be something as simple as uh, you ran a high state or a high state was scheduled and completed, or you can create your own. Uh, I just saw some stuff hit the tree that uses like I notify. So you know when a file hits a directory and, or something like that or changes, um, that could be an event. Uh, you can basically create or, or harvest whatever you need. Um, so I could leverage it from my application, like if a yeah, you, you exactly. You're you're a PDF got uploaded. Now go process it and sure do everything. Right, and uh, it's it's very flexible in that regard. You can you can go in and add your own to any of these things that they give you. But out of the box, there's you know generally pretty uh, standard support for things you'd want to do. And I know that this is a Linux thing, but uh, have you had any experience with pushing to Windows servers? I have not yet. Um, we've thought about it, and we're not sure uh, whether we want to go down that road or not. Salt does have support for Windows to the extent I can't tell you from personal experience. Um, my personal gut inclination is not to do that. I think. You know, you probably want to live in the Windows sandbox when you're when you're doing Windows. Um, how would I do? How, or so everybody, how would I do configuration management in a Windows? I, well, Microsoft has products, you know, System Center that that do that kind of stuff for you. Is it uh, I believe so. They've got PowerShell and, and things like that. So the reason why, and and this is very, I mean, this is my personal opinion, but the reason why you want to do that is because you want to be able to hire people with the skill set, like. Me, as a FreeBSD guy, if you tell me to go work on Windows systems, I'm going to laugh at you. Like, and so when you mix those two things, you're, like, you're asking for unicorns when you go to hire people. Um, you, you should... I'm just trying yeah. to grow a horn, so... <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that, uh, Salt does support Windows, so uh, it's not... Don't let my personal opinion dissuade you from, from looking into that. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this is like how configuration, configuration management systems really work, or really, I guess orchestration systems work. But um, does it handle like for like dependency or versioning of different apps for the same app? You can have multiple versions of the same application available or something. Like that? Yeah. So that gets very implementation specific. Like, um, for instance, if you're using your operating systems package manager, you can pin a version. Uh, and that's very easy to express in SALT as a state. Um, but, you know, that, that question can go many different ways. If, you're, if, you're, if you've got versions of your software that you have deployed differently, you could discover that with SALT, and you could say, when you detect this version of the software, use this version of the configuration or, or things like that. It's, it's very, the question's very open to the implementation, but... Primarily, I would guess that you're talking about like you know a package version, um, and and that's very easy to express in in the in salt. Um. If you have mixed versions, isn't like, and this is maybe a, a topic about con, uh, configuration management in general. Isn't what you're trying to do is make sure everybody's on one version? So if it, if you found somebody old, wouldn't you want to? Yeah, it, it it really depends. I mean, it, again, the the question depends on what. You know, you, we, it's easier to, to investigate like uh, a realistic example, but 
you might want to do like a slow roll of something. Therefore, you might want to keep a certain percentage of your machines on the older version. Um, and you know you need a way to, to be able to do that. And, and you can pretty trivially build things like that with salt, you know, just by either doing conditional or detection <coughs> in your state. He gave a specific example that we're trying to run two different versions of Ubuntu LTS. Oh. So the version of Apache available, the version of Nginx available, will be different on those. Um, and then in the particular case of the service I run, I've actually got four different versions in production uh, because I need to go beat some devs in a different group who aren't as responsive to yeah. get them to upgrade to versions <laughs> that were created in this century. I, actually, I like Han's answer a lot because you, know, you, you, you develop these accidental complexities or accidental uh, dependencies in the real world. So you know, uh, one team might require you know, a certain version of MySQL or a certain version of Apache or whatever, and it, you know, they're doing other things so they can't be on the same version as that team right away. So uh, generally you just detect that or, or codify it somehow as, as a, a class of machine or or what have you. There's a lot of ways to do it, but um, salt, salt gives you the rope you need to... To hang yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, cause see, I'm, I'm starting this, and I'm starting small with like a green field, so I'm like, yep. all right, build everything identical. Yeah, what, what's interesting is a lot of these problems aren't like salt... You know, the tool is just a means to an end. Like, you could do this with shell scripts if, if you needed to, um, but you know, you, you run into the same problems whatever tool you're using, and you know, Salt has pretty good examples and utilities to kind of help you handle them. Um, just, you know, yes. Uh, have you looked at using Docker at all in your workflow, and if you have, um, can Salt be used to orchestrate containers? Yeah. So the the direction we're going right now is to not actually use Docker. Um, we're talking to LXC and FreeBSD Jails raw. Um, this was, uh, the, the reasons why uh, most of our apps have, you know, kind of intrinsic dependencies. We're not to the point where we're deploying like a single process in a container or something. That Docker is, that's the, the, the right way to use Docker. I know you can do other things, but um, the other thing is there's some overlap between what a tool like Salt gives you in terms of spinning up those containers and putting software into them and configuration into them, where I personally don't see the, the value there to, to adding yet another component. Um, but we haven't written it off. It's just it's not in the next year's roadmap for sure. Um, we're kind of in a wait and see on that one. Go ahead. Do you have, uh, can you give any additional detail on the, the bus connecting the nodes? That sounds like an interesting, unique. Sure. So um, the, the bus that Salt uses is 0MQ right now. Uh, they're working on a new uh, Python. They, they built their own. It's called uh, R-A-E-T. Um, and that's going to be the future but right now, everything's over 0MQ. Uh, basically, you, when you run the master or spin up a, um, a minion, you've got uh, these two persistent you know, connections that, uh, that you, you do pub sub, basically, for, for all this. Uh, comment on the bus thing. We're actually looking at using the event bus to transfer information from nodes to the master and manage it from the SQL database. So like the nodes will report in their data using the event bus, the same bus that um, you can build your scripts off of and all that. And when that information reaches the master, it gets handled by our stuff and put into the SQL database. Then Salt can actually interface with SQL databases and work its magic. I don't know enough about all that to say much more than that, but the event bus can actually manage uh, two megabyte um, uploads using a system similar to what we're using. And the limitation, I think, is the uh, encryption on the side of the minion. So ours are embedded systems, which is... Okay, when, when, when you say event bus, it's separate from, it's kind of inside, I think it's on zero cube. Like it's yeah, so there, there's a, 
zero MQ is the transport, and then salt has its own, you know, uh, language that it talks. Um, so we we're using this to we spy on the bus, if you will, to inject stuff into Elasticsearch. Um, that was the that's not the only way you could do that, but it, it seemed the best way for our particular case. So we watch traffic on the bus, and we have a whitelist of things that are interesting, and we feed that into uh, these different indexes. Okay, but there's basically a, a blessed bus, zero MQ. Yep. Yeah, that's the, the current. And then, like I was saying, the, the, the rate will eventually uh, overtake that, I think. Um, it's designed to be a little bit more scalable and uh, tighter, you know, integration with salt. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.